OK, folks, it's a, it's a couple of minutes after the hour, so we'll just make a start. And Greg, you'll just keep an eye on the lobby and let more people join if they continue to join in. Yep. Is that OK? Right, so welcome everybody um, to Baker Tilly's um, 2022 contribution to Tech Week. Um, how safe is your business? Uh, my name's Rob McEwen and I'm one of the directors here at Baker Tilly. Um, and my responsibility area is uh, for the um, Business Computing Services team and the Human Resources team here. And so I take a, a great deal of interest in um, issues like cybersecurity and uh, what people are doing both inside and outside the company. Um, so I'm just going to um, just flick my presentation around a little bit, um, put myself down here in the corner, make it nice and easy to see what I'm see me talking while I'm continuing to talk, um, and we'll get we'll get started. So uh, Greg, if you just keep doing the admits as people join, that'll be awesome. Not a problem. Um, while we're going, um, we're going to take questions at the end, um, but we'd like to encourage you to. Um, put your questions into the chat window within Microsoft Teams so that we can um, come, come, come back to those you know, at the end. Uh, and Greg will, Greg will answer any questions he can um, quickly while we're going, but if we can't, then we'll just um, verbalise those and take those questions at the end. Um, the other thing is we are recording this presentation. If anybody would like to object to that or has any reason that they don't want to be recorded, um, remember that you're not actually going to be speaking. Your questions might be read out, but... Um, uh, just let us know and again do that through the chat window if you've got a reason that you, you think we shouldn't actually be recording the presentation today. Okay, so we'll make a start. Um, cyber security is an interesting subject. <clears throat> this is a, a, a quote that kind of resonates with me a little bit because I find this a lot with businesses um, uh, that we talk to. Um, that sometimes we do find we spend more on coffee than we do on cyber security. Um, and a, a, Fortunately, in our own business, while we do spend a lot on coffee, um, we do actually spend a little bit more on cybersecurity than that. So um, uh, we feel that we're in a pretty good position. But it's also it's a good question to ask yourselves when you're thinking about cybersecurity um, in your own businesses and in, in the workplaces. You know, do we actually have a budget for it? Is anybody actually talking about cyber cybersecurity as a separate budget item and not just part of the IT budget? Uh, so I thought I'd throw this quote in to start with just to um, uh, to get you thinking about that, get thinking about cyber security in that way. So to start with, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce you to an organisation called CERT. If you haven't heard of them before, CERT is the um, Cyber Security Emergency Response Team. Um, and they were set up by the New Zealand government back in 2016 um, when they added uh, a line item to the budget at the time that said we needed to have a national response or be nationally prepared for um, cyber um, cyber incidents or computer incidents. Um, so they established the, um, or it's called the Computer Emergency Response Team is what CERT stands for. Um, and they do a lot of work um, analyzing the um, the amount of cyber security threats that are hitting the country, hitting New Zealand businesses, and the types of those types of threats. And as you can see there, their reported statistics over just over those um, 2019 to 2021 year, just showing, you know, overall we're seeing continued growth in reported cybersecurity events, um, as well as growth in the total losses that are being reported to CertNZ. Um, but I often ask people, have they ever heard of CertNZ before? And would they report their cyber losses um, if they had known about CERT being there? Um, my estimation of this is that they're probably getting still less than 10% of incidents reported um, to them. There's a lot of people don't know that they exist. Um, they don't see the benefit in reporting that they've had losses um, associated with cyber security. Um, and so I very much think that the numbers we're looking at here is the tip of the iceberg. But what it does show you, you know, if you assume that that is the tip of the iceberg, $69 million since Q2 2017, um, that probably represents something a lot larger. You could be talking about um, not $70 million, but $700 million if we're only seeing about 10% of businesses actually reporting their losses. So I think this it is a big industry, cyber um, attacks, and we are all vulnerable to it. So we have to do something about that. Um, in the same report that CERT put out at the end of last year, their Q4 2021 report, um, they showed again that malware is still the big threat uh, to New Zealand businesses. Um, and then phishing and credential harvesting was the next biggest. So that's um, uh, malware is quite 
you know, most of us, I think, in business would recognise the need for having some antivirus software on our um, on our computers, and we might have a antivirus filter on our email gateway, and we're doing the best we can to filter that malware out. Um, but the phishing and credential harvesting, that's a big threat for New Zealand businesses, and we're probably not as good at taking care of that one as, as we are for um, the malware. And then outright scams and fraud, There's a, that's another big, um, big item there, big ticket item. And you can see that it's continuing to increase uh, another 16% from Q3 2021. But again, I just want to highlight that these represent the proportion of the different um, attacks that are out there. Uh, the reality is I think there's a lot more out there than, than people actually ever report to, to CERT. Okay. Um, when we talk about um, hackers and things that go on in, in the media, quite often we see things like this, um, which kind of expresses um, I guess a, a view of hacking that it's actually beneficial to society in some way. And these hackers, uh, and I think this might have been um, uh, Anonymous, the hacking group called Anonymous that did this, but they basically hacked into the Russian TV, uh, you know, state-owned TV um, during Victory Day Parade, and they put anti-war messages all over the TV um, broadcast while um, Vladimir Putin was, um, you know, standing on the podium there and, you uh, Red Square, you know, watching his troops go by. Um, so this is kind of a view of hacking that some people have that says actually it doesn't do any real harm. There's people out there that know how to do this hacking stuff. And uh, we, we are quite safe from it, quite immune from it, because we're not waging war on anybody. And um, and the, uh, the, uh, the impact is quite light. You know, uh, um, I don't know if anybody's uh, seen articles like this or, you know, is, is um, thinking the same as I am that you know that's kind of funny that they actually did this to, to Vladimir um, and his cohort that they 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 hacked and they embarrassed him in this way. Um, but when you get a little bit closer to home, um, we'll all be familiar with this Waikato DHB hack that actually closed pretty much the entire IT system of the Waikato DHB um, down, and that DHB services um, a client base that's probably about ten times as much as. Taranaki's DHB does. So there's a lot of people were impacted by that, including some of our own residents who, you know, had their surgeries deferred or, you know, couldn't quite go get the stent put in their heart up at Taranaki because they couldn't manage the um, the processes correctly. Uh, that's that, that particular DHB hack resulted in the complete loss of systems. Systems that were working one day were completely down the next day. And the recovery of that was long and drawn out, as we all know. Um, it was reported in the media over and over again about the, the Waikato DHB hack. Um, I know from personal experience of having talked to some of the people that worked up there at the time, just how tough it was um, dealing with it. Um, they were doing things like their payroll was being done manually using Excel spreadsheets. Um, and so any payroll officers that are on the call, um, I'm sure you can imagine how tricky that would be for um, for an organisation of that size and with that level of complexity to try to manage payroll um, in that way. So they lost a lot of um, uh, time, a lot of credibility. Um, they lost a lot of people, um, people that left after the, uh, the DHB were hacked and felt that they couldn't carry on. Um, and, and, you know, probably coming out of it stronger um, uh, afterwards, but yeah, incredibly embarrassing for those involved. Um, and, and they they were able to be hacked because they didn't follow a few basic rules. And we're going to cover some of those um, a little bit further on. But uh, there was a very, very significant event and not quite so funny as the Vladimir Putin example. OK, just carry on. I'll just go to the next screen. So now we're going to talk about hacks that happen here in Tar Taranaki. So um, the reason I put this beautiful picture up is because we don't really have examples where we are allowed to um, talk about with you. Uh, sorry, Anne, I saw you putting your hand up. Um, if you've you got a question, if you type it, in, type it into the comments, um, then uh, we'll answer you in the comments, if that's okay. Um, in Taranaki, we have um, many instances of businesses being hacked, um, but one of the things that's kind of interesting about our culture is that we don't talk about it very much, which is one of the reasons that leads me to suspect that, that information that's provided to 
as by cert is so, so is just the tip of the iceberg because there are organisations you know that will report self report there are organisations large government departments for example that are compelled to report but small businesses don't do it they barely talk about it amongst their mates um, they will be hacked they will lose money um, they will talk about it with us as their accountants or as their IT provider um, but you'll never hear about it in the news and you'll never see um, a great deal of discussion happening um, in in the public domain about what's gone on with them. Um, the only exceptions to that really is where a client has lost um, personal identifiable information and under the Privacy Act has to make a disclosure. So then you then you hear about it. But in most cases, when it's simply um, they've been defrauded of money, um, they're very reluctant to speak about it. So what we've decided to do here is to to create an example case for for us to talk about. Um, based on a number of people that we know who we see in a business around Taranaki who have experienced this kind of hack. Um, so what, I, what I'd like to do is introduce you to my made up person who's not real, um, but he is representative. So his name's Fred. And you can see Fred's a pretty good looking guy. He's, he's busy, he's on the phone, he's got his computer in front of him, and he's doing a lot of, a lot of good work. So Fred owns a mid-sized Taranaki business. He employs around 40 trade staff. Um, he's an active, busy kind of guy with a young family at home. So you guys might recognize yourselves in this. You might recognize your boss and think that, that sounds a bit like my boss. Um, it could be your boss um, that we're talking about, um, or it could be you know, just somebody that we know in the community here. But um, Craig, sorry, Fred, I should say, um, he, he's got, uh, as I said, a young, a young family and he loves his daughter. He's got one child and he loves her so much that he decided he was going to use his daughter's name and the year of her birth as a password. Um, and I know from personal experience that I've done this before. This is, this is me probably about 15 years ago um, and I've done exactly the same thing and then realised the error of my ways along the way. Uh, but a lot of people do do it. Um, and his daughter was Brittany and she was born in 2010. So if you can see this can happen, if you think this is this is me, okay, what's the rest of the story gonna look like? Um, well, we'll tell you in a second. So Fred um, operates his business with um, the help of a lady called Mary. And Mary does all the admin in his business. And this is quite common in Taranaki businesses. You'll have that stalwart of the business who does the accounts payable, the accounts receivable, payroll and all the banking. Um, They've been there, been there forever. Um, she's been with the firm for 35 years. She's actually there before um, Fred bought the business. She came with the furniture. Um, she's got an incredibly um, good worth ethic, ethic. She's very trustworthy. She works hard and diligently for Fred. And, you know, um, she's got his complete confidence. She enjoys the trust that Fred gives her and he values her for being able to support him and getting things done. OK, I just see I'm still admitting a few guests, so you've, you've missed an early part of the presentation, but it is being recorded, so we'll be able to distribute that as well if, um, if people need to see the start. OK, so now we're going to move on to the, uh, the final player in our discussion, and this, this is a guy called Dave. Um, and Dave, uh, we don't actually know where Dave um, lives or works, you know, he's, uh, he kind of looks a little bit like the boy next door. Um, he went away and he studied computer science at a very expensive university somewhere in the world. And this is very typical of the sort of people who are uh, involved in the hacking and attacking um, community right now, is that they are educated. Um, they are well positioned to, um, to take on the challenges that um, you know, the, the software presents because they, they've studied it, they've learned all about this stuff. But he's left himself with a massive student debt and he can't find, seem to find himself a good paying job. It's a, it's a little bit tough out there, um, especially in these um, post COVID times to get, a, to get a good job in IT. Well, he's, he's found it tough anyway. Um, and, uh, but it's sort of left him in a situation where he's got a computer, he's got the internet, he's got a lot of knowledge, he's got a lot of ideas about what he could do with all that knowledge. Um, and he's got a lot of time. He's got all the time in the world um, to, to, to do something with, that knowledge that he's that he's got. Um, and this is very typical for, as I said before, for people that are working in the cyber attack industry, and it is an industry now um, where people are actually pretty much employed by cyber attacking. It, I'd call them corporates, but they're really it's an organised crime syndicate and things like that. But they are out there 
um, and they are employing large groups of people and those people are coming after you and me. So Dave is one of these guys. Um, he may not look just like this guy, but he may just look just like him. You just don't know, and we don't know where he lives. Um, he can hide where he lives, uh, and he's, uh, but he's definitely out there. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Dave might fill his day, just to give you a little bit of an example of how these hackers actually manipulate um, their way into our lives and then execute an attack on us. So Dave, um, he's figured out that if he goes to this public website called pastebin.com, he's able to download material that other people just put up there. And I, I kind of describe Pastebin as the dumping ground of the internet. It's where people who have um, obtained uh, information illegally um, or through some other hack, they decide to share it out onto the public internet and um, make it available for others. So you can go to pastebin.com and you can download lists of common usernames and passwords. Um, there are plenty of other sites on the internet that you can do that from as well. Um, and it, I was reading an article before um, I did this presentation and I was it was talking about the billions, literally billions of username and password combinations that are available in databases and in password lists on the internet. So it's very genuine that Dave just goes and does this. He's just sitting there thinking, how am I going to fill my day? I'm going to download a list of usernames and passwords that are publicly available on the internet. So then he takes his computer and he sets up a little script that's going to quietly try every single one of those usernames and passwords against Office 365. So he doesn't have to sit there typing in each one. He just sets the system going and walks away and leaves it and then comes back to see what was successful. When he comes, when he does come back, he finds that he was able to, to um, log into Fred's account because Fred did something that um, you know, we wouldn't recommend you do. He used the same password that he had in his LinkedIn account um, uh, with his Office 365. Um, now, if you're not aware, LinkedIn was hacked in 2012 and all their account credentials were stolen. Um, at the time, they forced everybody to do a password reset. But what happens here is that Dave used his LinkedIn account. He might have reset his LinkedIn account password, but he um, used the same password because that's his habit when he came to setting up a password in Office 365. So he suddenly had left himself exposed because he had a credential and a password that were um, uh, able to be exploited on a different site from the one that it was originally used on or originally exposed on. Um, and this is an issue known as password hygiene issue. You know, so he's, he's not maintained a good password hygiene. That's keeping your passwords clean between different sites. He inadvertently created a situation for himself where his password was able to be exploited. OK. So Dave logged into Fred's Office 365 account and he simply observes. And this is where he sits and watches. In the old days, hackers used to log into your system and they'd wreak havoc as quickly as they possibly could because they thought they were going to get found out quickly and be gone. These days, they log in and they sit and they observe what goes on on your network. They actually work quietly to see what else could they do, where else can they reach, um, how can they exploit their access to your system or to your password or to your account um, in the most beneficial way possible. So Dave is sitting there observing that Fred periodically sends Mary um, invoices that he receives from uh, various suppliers and just asks for them to be paid. Seems pretty straightforward. Mary does that for um, Dave all the time. Uh, sorry, for Fred all the time. Um, and so he observes that all he really has to do to exploit that situation is to fake an invoice um, and send it to Mary from Fred's account. Um, when Mary receives it, it looks like it's just come from Fred um, and she has no reason to question it. Um, she knows that Fred values her efficiency at getting things done and she just goes ahead and does it. Um, so naturally, the invoice gets paid. After this, there's an issue about where did it get paid to? Which bank account did it go to? Can you recover funds from that bank account? And there's lots of things that go on behind the scenes with these hackers to move money out of the country. They do things like, um, you know, they, they will attack a, uh, a pensioner's banking system because the pensioners usually have very weak passwords, but there's no money in them. So there's, they're going to um, just use that account as a beachhead for doing some kind of fake transaction to help them move money out of the country. Um, there's all sorts of other ways that they, they can do that. Um, 
But, you know, we're not going to get into all that level of detail in the presentation, but just be aware that once the money starts to move, these hackers have usually got ways to move it further out as quickly as they can. And that's what they're going to try and do. So Mary's made the payment. OK, so they've lost some money. Um, and I, as I'll go back and mention this again, that this does happen and it's happened multiple times in Taranaki and it's not in the news. So this is why we thought we would do this presentation today, just to let people know that it goes on and give you some tips and tricks as to how to avoid it, how to make sure that you're protected. OK. OK, sorry, just reading some of the chat. Obviously, Greg's taking care of it as much as he can. Um, so yeah, Mary's paid the bill. That's awesome. Um, the hacker's got his money. <laughs> okay, so we mentioned CERT before, um, and one of the things that CERT do for us is every year they issue a list of critical controls, um, and their critical controls are, are created against the incidents that they've seen over the past 12 months. And what they're saying is that if you correctly implement these controls, it would have prevented, detected, or contained the majority of the attacks seen in the past year. And this is information that's publicly available. It's, there's no great secret to it. If you just Google um, CERT NZ, um, and then you can get in there and you can see what their lists of critical controls are. And that's what we encourage you to do. Um, and to have those conversations about these critical controls with your IT manager, your IT provider, um, you know, within your business, within your leadership team, talking about these things actually brings them to the surface and people start to realise that they can do something to protect themselves from these most obvious um, hacking strategies. Um, but also when you're implementing these critical con controls, you're also preventing the, the less obvious hacking strategy. So I've, I've created a scenario here and talked to you about one that is very obvious, very simple, but the same critical controls, if they're implemented correctly, will prevent the majority of what's out there. I always think, um, and I describe it often as having a soft underbelly. Um, if you don't have these critical controls in place, you have a soft underbelly and the hackers will come after you. The minute they come up against one of them, they will stop. And we see that happen time and time again as well. So let's just talk a little bit about these critical controls. So the first one's really obvious. It's the one that we keep hanging on about, about patching your software and systems and keeping them up to date. So it's kind of recognize now that the minute a patch is released by people like Microsoft or Adobe, um, the hackers take that patch, they reverse engineer, engineer it to figure out what the patch was fixing, and they instantly write attacks based on that fix so that they can go after all of the computers in the world that haven't been patched yet. So it's um, critical that everybody patches their systems as quickly as they can after those critical and security patches have been released. Um, we recommend doing it overnight. So as soon as they're released, their PCs are patched overnight. Um, and if you've got that kind of automation in place, you can have a lot of comfort in the fact that you're going to be um, hardening your PC infrastructure before um, the hackers really get you know, to, to, to target you. It's a little bit more difficult in the server world, um, but there's more server protection usually in place around it uh, to prevent um, uh, these vulnerabilities being exploited, like things like firewalls and stuff. But with the PCs, PCs in particular, uh, laptops, you know, they're out there, they're being used in home networks, they're being used in airports, they're being used in hotels, they're being used in the office. And so getting the patches onto those wherever they are, as soon as they become available, is really, really important. Um, overnight patching, overnight rebooting, it should be a must in everybody's um, toolbox of how they keep those things sorted out. So I need to click the next one. Now this is um, the, one of the um, controls that would immediately have stop, stopped the scenario we discussed earlier. So having multi-factor authentication and verification is something that is becoming more and more common. I think a lot of people now recognize if they're using products like Xero, Xero making it mandatory, Office 365 is making it mandatory for all new signups and all existing clients it's going to become mandatory for eventually. Um, and it means that people have some additional layers of protection that prevents the hacker from doing exactly as um, Dave did above, where he was able just to try testing a username and a password, see if he could get in, and once he's got in, he's got no further challenge. If you had multi-factor authentication, um, then the multi-factor authentication would have instantly brought up a block for for Dave, and he would have been required to enter one of, you know, millions of different password combinations that are random and changing all the time. 
um, and he wouldn't have been able to do it. So he would have given up and walked away at that stage from Dave's account. He would have said, good try, but you know, you guys have got the, the layer of security that just thwarts me at the first step and I'm, I'm gone from here. Um, he would have moved on to the next guy on the list. Provide and use a password manager. So a password manager is one of these tools that we recommend people consider implementing enterprise wide because nowadays passwords are something that um, everybody um, has and they have in all sorts of places all over the internet um, and they have them for work and they have them for personal use. Now it's um, common for people to do something risky with a password for personal use um, and then replicate that same password for something that they're, they're doing for work. Uh, so you might say, well, that's that's not a big deal, Rob, but what if you're, um, you know, if, let's just uh, pick it in an example. Let's say you were using a password for a site like weightwatchers.com um, and they got hacked and then your same password again was being used for something business related like Westpac Bank. Um, you're just leaving yourself open. So what a password manager is going to do for you, it's going to help you to do the password hygiene where passwords are unique and long and complicated for every um, for every site that you visit. Um, it's going to allow you to report on password hygiene as an individual. And also, if you do it as an enterprise, you can report on password security across the entire business. How robust is the password practices used by, um, by your staff? Um, there are various password managers out there. I'll give you a couple of names. There's products like Dashlane and LastPass, which are very, very common and widely used. Um, and there are also some free password managers that are also worthy of consideration if you if you have a lower budget. But having these commercial products in there um, centrally managed um, and setting it up so that your staff are required to use them by both policy and by controls, um, you can reduce the, uh, the risk of poor password hygiene becoming a problem. Configure logging and alerting. Now, this is something most people don't really recognize as going on, but if we use the example of um, Fred before, he was using Office 365, and Office 365 logs everything, and it also generates alerts for all sorts of things. So it would generate an alert for a risky login. That risky login is um, what happens when somebody logs in from a different country. It's recognized as a risky login. Now, you can, as a uh, Office 365 customer, you can set policy on your Office 365 tenant that says risky logins must be authenticated with two-factor. But if that's not been done, then risky logins can be allowed to log in. Um, but you can also have alerts being generated, for example, and the, and the system will generate alerts and typically sends them to the administrator account that was used to set up the Office 365 environment. Quite often, because that's often done by the IT guy, um, it's not done in a way that is just left so that that forwarded email is going to go to anybody. It's just going to sit in an administrator's mailbox and nobody's actually going to look at it. So if you come back and talk to your IT guys about where do our logs go? Where do our alerts go? Do they go to your help desk or do they go to our help desk? Or should they go to our, um, uh, our business manager so that they can see when something risky happens? Like, for example, somebody tried to log in from Kazakhstan. OK, or they try to log in from Russia. You know, you, you need to know that those things are happening um, so that you could do something about them. Even if you've let them in before they actually exploit the situation, maybe you could do something about it if you knew it was happening. So there's lots of logs out there. There's lots of alerting out there. But if it's not flowing somewhere, people can see it. Um, it's not doing you any good at all. OK, asset lifecycle management, that's the control number five. This is talking about what happens in terms of the assets that you buy. Are you buying the right kind of stuff to keep your network secure? And then what happens when the, when you're get, getting rid of them? So when you're getting rid of old desktops and laptops, are you cleaning them up properly? Are you destroying the hard disks to make sure that the data is not going to leak? All of that kind of stuff. Um, Implement and test backups. It seems obvious, but we still come across businesses where backups constitute a USB thumb drive that gets um, a couple of files put on it and goes home at night. And that's really not good enough uh, in the modern environment. Um, cloud backup these days. So if you've got the internet connection, there's lots of cloud backup options that are out there that can be fully automated and be very cost effective. And I think if you haven't implemented automated cloud backup and have your data moving off site, um, 
already, you need to think about doing that. So backups are essential. Um, one of the issues that they, um, they had, if you go back and look at the Waikato situation, is they had backups, um, but some of those backups were, they were quite nervous about them. Uh, they were tape. They were still backing up to tape a large amount of their data, and they hadn't really tested it properly. So uh, just make sure that you're testing your backup, that you've tested your recovery plan and that it works. And take action if it doesn't. You need to make sure it's working. Um, application control. So application control refers to actually whitelisting which applications you are allowing your employees to use on their PCs. It's not necessary that um, in a small business that you do that, but uh, in larger corporate environments, this is uh, far more far more common. Um, but application control is something you you, sh you can actually implement at a PC level, um, and you can consider talking to your IT guys about how, how they would restrict application use to applications that are business related only. And then we talk about enforcing the principle of least privilege. So this is where we want to make sure that a person using a PC does so as a user of a PC and not as an administrator. So the reason I've highlighted it in this case is not so much about that PC permission, but it's also that permission about making payments. So it's the permission of being able to say, OK, I'm going to set up a new um, bank account for this new vendor that I've received an email about from Fred. Um, I'm going to put in their bank account details and I'm going to make a payment and I'm one person controlling all of that. Um, we all know that good practice around these sorts of things is to have um, segregation of duties in a job like this, but there's many situations where that's not happening. It happens at the PC level where people are installing their own software, it happens at the accounting level where people are setting up and making payments to, um, to vendors without going through a, a second person check or a banking check. And then implementing networking segmentation, again, not so um, prevalent in the small business world, but much but much more required in a large business environment. And so getting secure defaults for macros. OK, so as a, again, all of this information is available on the CERT website, and there are papers behind all of these that you can download and read, um, and they will talk about what, what you know, good practice looks like in all of these um, areas. So. So finally, the last thing I wanted to try to talk about today, and I'm just checking my time out, time out here, we're getting there, is I wanted to talk about um, cyber insurance. It's very common now for um, our clients um, to present us with their cyber insurance policy and ask us, you know, do we actually comply with this? Is there anything in here I need to do to make sure I'm not voiding my insurance obligations? And so we quite often look for um, a a section in the policy that will actually talk about the obligations that the customer has. Um, so you can see here, this is actually verbatim out of a cyber um, cyber insurance policy. Um, if there's insurance people on the call, you'll probably recognise it. Um, I'll let you let you comment if you if you do. Um, and this policy has things in it like um, the. The, the customer is obliged to provide written training materials to all employees regarding the dangers of social engineering fraud, phishing and freaking, um, which incorporate regular review. And of course, they don't tell you what regular review looks like. They give you an idea that you need to do something that's not just a one hit wonder. Um, but it's up to you really to, to determine what regular is going to look like for your business and how you're going to achieve it. So we had um, a situation where we've got a customer who was using a solution called Proofpoint, um, and they were using that to test their staff to see if they knew how to detect a phishing email. Um, if the staff clicked on the test email, it took them off and it gave them training. Um, so the training was presented in video format and interactive questions afterwards. So very sophisticated system, but it wasn't so much printed written material as it was digital presented material. So in this situation, we advised the client to go back to the broker and say, are you happy with this? Can you confirm in writing that our use of Proofpoint is a satisfactory solution to cover this clause? The next one, changing passwords for all online accounts and banking platforms maintained by the insured at least every 45 days and that the password protocols accord with industry best practice. So I would describe this as an oxymoron because it's no longer considered industry best practice in, in quite wide circles to force password changes every 45 days, but the insurance policy requires it. 
So you have to do it, otherwise you're going to breach your policy. So this is why we think it's, you know, it's tricky. And so I'm going to step aside from that so you can read it. Um, it's, it's your policy, yeah, so you could void your policy. So, so again, in this case, we would say, go back to your broker and say, we actually have advice that says um, that that's no longer considered best practice. It's actually best practice to do something better than that, like have a password um, manager where we're making sure we've got good password hygiene, not forcing password changes every 45 days, but between that password manager and two-factor authentication and other things that we're doing, does that satisfy the requirement for some good password discipline um, over and above what you've put here in the, the um, insurance policy? Um, so you find this stuff in insurance policies is they sometimes can sit a little bit behind current thinking around what best practice looks like. So uh, it's not an easy thing to, to resolve and some, some insurance companies might change it. Others will say, no, you don't, you've got to do it our way. If they say that, then you've got to start figuring out how to enforce it. And preventing any one individual to pay, deliver, or transfer money or securities valued at more than $2,000 from an account maintained by the insured without a second individual authorizing such a transaction. And of course, if we think back to our situation with um, Mary being allowed to do all of that work on her own and make the payment, um, she would have voided the, or that, that, sorry, not necessarily her fault, but that company has voided their cyber insurance policy because they've allowed that situation to exist. So they would have to make sure they put in appropriate controls around the banking and the setting up of accounts so that such a, a thing couldn't happen. Um, so let's just go through that. So again, this is, this is something that's um, required where they're gonna have to make sure that their procedures for banking uh, are, are compliant with their um, insurance policy. Otherwise, you know, the insurance company is quite legitimately allowed to say, hey, look, we gave you the advice about what you were supposed to do and you didn't do it. Um, why would we be culpable for um, your losses when you're not doing anything um, to simply take care of the risk? So, OK, um, that pretty much sums up. So what I want to do now is just go through the uh, questions. Uh, Greg, do we have questions um, coming through? No, I don't have no questions here, Rob. Everyone okay. seemed... Um... But if there is, if you do have any questions, now's an opportunity. Yep. So just throw your questions into the chat. Okay. So I've had a question there about what does it happen when employees work from home? Does that throw up any additional risks? And the answer is yes, it does. <laughs> it throws up significant additional risks. Um, when an employee is working in the office environment, especially if it's a reasonably large office, quite often um, you're sitting behind firewalls, you've got a, a level of control of the entire environment that um, uh, exists in, in, the, um, in that office environment. When a person takes their laptop home and they're sitting on the network at home, they're sitting on the net, same network as that Philips light bulb, the Hue light bulb that changes colour, as the um, fancy smart TV, which has a operating system in it that allows you to stream Netflix onto it. Um, and all of those devices actually all pose a threat to cyber security for business computing because they could be a gatehead, uh, sort of a gateway for hackers to get into um, into your network. And once they're in, they start looking for business, you know, targets of opportunity that might be operating inside that home network. So, you know, um, the correct way to set up your home network these days, if you if you if you do it, is you have a um, you have a trusted network for your computers, and you should have an Internet of Things network, a separate network, uh, separate Wi-Fi, um, if you're using Wi-Fi for those types of devices, and just do not trust them. Um, there are cases out there of products that have been manufactured in China, coming out with um, backdoors hard coded onto the silicon, um, and that will go into things like your security cameras. Uh, network switches, um, all sorts of devices that people are putting into their homes. Um, yeah, and they don't get updated. There's also, in a lot of these Internet of Things devices, there are stacks for communications that exist that are hard coded. They are found to have vulnerabilities in them and there is no way to patch them. They do not get patched. So it's really important that those people who are working at home recognize that, that being at home actually does pose a risk. The way we kind of advise clients on that is to say, your computer, the one that you took out of the office, that is your bastion host. That is the only thing that you can treat as safe. Nothing else in the house is safe. Um, so you need to make sure that that computer is safe at home 
at the hotel, at the airport, everywhere else that it's working. So that computer has to be set up securely. OK. OK, the regularly enforcing password changes. So the questions come through is why is it now not considered best practice to regularly enforce password changes? And that's because people who are asked to regularly change their password increment it by one. And everybody knows that and the hackers know it. It's proven um, time and time again that if you're forced into a password change every 30 days, every 45 days, 90 days, um, and your password is Brittany 2010, um, you're just as likely to change it to Britney 2011, Britney 2012, Britney 2013, you know, incrementing it up that way. Um, and so the password's being compromised. When somebody sees that somebody has a password with a one on it or two on it or three on it, they will try four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They, they will just try the incrementals. OK, back to working from home risks. How might managers deal with that, given that it's harder for them to enforce might employees void cyber insurance through inadvertently not complying with guidelines? Uh, yeah, so as I said before, um, as an IT um, department or company or whatever, um, you've got to look at the devices that people are using when they go home. We're making the assumption that they are using their work computer and you have control over how their work computer is configured. If they're using their home computer, for example, um, they've got a nice uh, um, Mac at home and they like to log on to that to do a few bits of work at night. They are in the situation where um, they're using it. You're using a computer for work related activity that is completely um, unmanaged in, in that sense. Um, there are various things that companies can do about that. Um, there are things like uh, policies that you can enforce on the network that says you don't actually get to log in until your your computer has actually verified that it has a working antivirus, that it is patched up to date, that it is, um, uh, you know, secured in, in other ways, like you're not operating as an administrator. So, so there are things that can be tested as you're logging in um, to, to see whether that computer that you're logging in from is actually trustworthy enough to actually allow it to do the job that you're asking it to do. Uh, again, that's kind of a, it's a more technical solution. And it would need to have a little bit of discussion with our engineers, but it can be can be done. OK, do we have any further questions? Uh, and our time is on 12.45 exactly, so that's a perfectly timed uh, webinar. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for attending and listening today. Um, I appreciate you um, uh, joining in with us. Um, I know some of you came along after um, we started the presentation, so I will see about how we go about making the presentation available um, to everybody who signed up uh, so that you can watch from the start if you'd like to. Um, any questions, um, myself or Greg Taylor would be more than happy to take a phone call, just have a chat, um, or if you'd like to email a question in, our, our details are published online. Um, at the bakertilliesa.nz website. OK, so uh, as an educational purpose, and what would be the best way to learn about this? OK. And OK, Jan so it's also asking about best cloud storage options as well. Yep, so um, so Fiona, first of all, what about the best cloud storage options? Um, I would argue that you know if you're using something like Office 365, I wouldn't go outside of that um, infrastructure. Um, so there's lots of cloud storage options out there. Um, it really does depend on what you're intending to do with it and the type of content you're putting up on it. Uh, it's probably something that we would rather talk to you about one-on-one -on -one to, to know a little bit more about your use case. Um, and for Tiffany, with your question around um, wanting to learn more about this, um, if you're really serious about getting into cybersecurity, there is actually a degree course that can be done at Victoria, uh, Waikato University. They, they run a degree course on this. Um, but if you're looking at it more from a uh, just wanting to know a bit more, there are lots of um, learning resources available online. And if you just get in touch with me offline, I can I can send you a link to some of those. OK. I see that. 
and I do see that even with people that come out of universities, if they haven't specifically targeted cybersecurity, it is usually only a very light touch that they receive while they're at university, except for the course that they do at the Waikato. Okay, so thank you very much, any, everybody, and uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch um, to, in touch with us if you have any further questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joe. See you later.